Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day that you have made. It is a day like no other. It's brand new, Lord, and it is filled with mercies from you. Lord, I pray that as we continue the study of the Gospel of John, that you would anoint my tongue to declare this word that you have given to me and anoint the ears that will hear it. Lord, we pray that as we study your word, you would draw us closer and closer to yourself, and I pray that we would be not only hearers of your word, but doers of it as well. Thank you for this word this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week in our reading from John chapter 2, Jesus had gone up to Jerusalem to the feast of Passover. There he made a whip of cords and drove out those who were selling animals for sacrifice in the temple, specifically in the court of the Gentiles. He also turned over the tables of the money changers. His father's house was not to be a den of thieves. It was supposed to be a, a place of prayer for all nations. When asked by the Jews what sign he would give them to show them that he had the authority to do what he was doing, Jesus answered them by saying, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Naturally, the Jews didn't understand Jesus' words. They were standing in the physical courts of a physical temple and they said, the temple had taken 46 years to complete. And he was going to raise it up in three days. But as we know, he was talking about the temple of his body, which three days after his crucifixion, Jesus did rise bodily from the tomb in which he had been laid. In the closing verses of John 2, we read, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knew that he could not entrust himself to man, for mankind born in sin is completely untrustworthy. We begin now with John chapter 3, but we've got to understand that John chapter 3 is a continuation of John chapter 2. The chapter divisions that we have in our Bibles are not original to the text. They were added by men many years later. And sometimes we get chapter breaks in odd places. So in John 3, Jesus is still in Jerusalem at the Passover feast. And he had been doing many signs in the sight of the people. So in verse 1 we read, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now we learn a lot about Nicodemus in these first two verses. First off, John tells us he's a Pharisee. He also tells us that he was a ruler of the Jews. The designation ruler by the Apostle John lets us know that Nicodemus wasn't any old Pharisee. He was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, a ruling body of 70 members, plus one more when you add the high priest to the group. So 71 men. The Sanhedrin was made up of men recruited from the priests, the Levites, and then ordinary Jews who were members of those families who had a pure lineage such that their daughters could be allowed to marry priests. A Pharisee wasn't a priest. He didn't, necessarily, he didn't belong to the tribe of the Levites. So Nicodemus would have been one of, among the ordinary Jews who had become a Pharisee and then was recruited to become a member of the Sanhedrin. He was indeed a ruler of the Jews. 
he had seen the signs Jesus had done, and he had heard what Jesus had been teaching during the Passover feast. He is the one who came to Jesus by night because he had questions he wanted to ask Jesus. He comes by night so as not to let his personal curiosity regarding Jesus be known to anyone. Now his first words to Jesus aren't a question, but a statement. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. What we can conclude here is that Nicodemus has heard Jesus teach and he has seen Jesus, what Jesus did. The conclusion he has reached is that Jesus is a teacher come from God. In other words, what he means by this is he sees Jesus as someone commissioned by God to come to teach Israel the things of God. Now this is a really big deal considering the last time God had sent one of his commissioned people to Israel was 400 years earlier. So it had been a long dry spell. But now Jesus had come teaching and doing amazing signs. And these have gotten the people's attention. When he states, we know that you are a teacher come from God, he wasn't speaking of the others among the Sanhedrin. He's simply speaking about those, the general crowds of chapter 2, who had seen Jesus do those signs. Many of whom we know from chapter 2 came to believe in Jesus because of the signs that he had done. Though Nicodemus has reached the conclusion that Jesus is someone commissioned by God, which to us sounds pretty good because it is good and it is true, Jesus sends a shockwave his direction by telling him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is an interesting statement by Jesus and it totally perplexes Nicodemus. Nicodemus had seen the signs Jesus had done. He had concluded that Jesus had been sent by God, but now Jesus tells him, and I'm going to restate Jesus' words a little differently, but the meaning is the same. Jesus now tells him, if, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. There's a condition for seeing the kingdom of God. One has to be born again. What does this mean? Well, Nicodemus certainly didn't know, so he asks, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? What other conclusion could he have reached except for the one that he did reach? Jesus is talking over his head. He's talking about something completely unfamiliar to Nicodemus. He needs more information and more clarification. And so then Jesus adds, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus has now clarified his statement about a person needing to be born again. He states that the birth he is speaking about is a new birth of water and the Spirit. He's speaking of baptism. Water is the earthly element used in baptism. And the Holy Spirit is the divine agent who brings about the new birth. Nicodemus has asked if a person can enter his mother's womb and be born again. But Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Stated another way, if a person could enter their mother's womb a hundred different times, a mother's womb can only give birth to flesh. The rebirth or being born again that Jesus speaks about is all about a spiritual birth. It's all about the spirit of the living God working in us that which we cannot do ourselves. In other words, spirit has to give birth to spirit. Now, if Nicodemus would have only asked, how can a man be born when he is old? Jesus' answer could have simply been stated like this. Be baptized. 
let's go on a short little rabbit trail here and ask the question, why were the crowds going to John the Baptist to be baptized? The answer is they had heard the words he had spoken. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. When we think about it, John's message is pretty astounding, and what he was doing was amazing. You know, we might say, well, what's so astounding about John's baptism? It was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. To come and, re re and confess your sins and then know that your sins have been forgiven, that's, that's just an amazing thing. And many people, we are told, heard his words and they responded to it. And they came, actually Mark 1, 5 says, Then all of the land of Judea and, from, and those from Jerusalem went, went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So John's message had touched a chord. It had pierced their hearts, pierced their souls, and they responded to the invitation. Getting back to John's gospel and Jesus' answer to Nicodemus, Jesus tells him, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Jesus' words, do not marvel to Nicodemus, were spoken to keep him from being stuck on the words, you must be born again. There are a lot of things that we can accept as, tr as true. There are a lot of things we can accept as true though we do not fully understand them. Okay? I mean, there's none of us who are physicists in this room and, you know, people with great mathematical skills. Um, you know, there are just some things we just have to accept as true. Okay? So, Jesus gives him an example that he can understand. Okay, he gives him an example that he can understand to keep him from getting stuck on the needing to be born again. He points to the wind and he states, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Like physical wind, the Spirit of God the wind of God, is always moving throughout the earth to birth people from above. You must be born again. You must be born from above. Now, we can hear the natural effects of wind, right? We can see the natural effects of wind. A person who has been born again, they can attest to the changes he or she has experienced in their own lives. And presumably, other people who have seen a person who has been born again can see those changes in that person as well. They simply are not the same people that they were before Christ and then after Christ. Jesus makes a difference. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? He's really not getting it. Actually, what he's trying to do is wrap his brain around truths that can only be spiritually discerned. The mind can't do what the spirit can do. It cannot do it. Verse 10, Jesus said and answered, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Now he's getting pretty personal here. To say the least, Jesus' words likely would have stung Nicodemus a bit. But I'm not surprised Nicodemus didn't know what Jesus was talking about. Grasping spiritual truths, they aren't taught. They are revealed. They aren't taught. They are revealed. And revelation generally comes by pondering the things of God. The problem is, is that too few people, even teachers of God's word, don't spend a lot of time pondering God's word. And most don't usually ponder things which go beyond what their teachers taught them. 
that would be going outside their little boxes. And most people don't do that because that would take them outside their comfort zones. It appears, however, that Jesus, he expected more of one who was the teacher of Israel. Now, he's not saying that Nicodemus is the only teacher, but he's saying, you're a teacher of Israel. You should know these things. He really should have known these things. He expected a teacher, the teacher of Israel, to know these things. And so in verse 11, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Who's we? I learned a lot this week about this chapter that I'd never known before. You know, it's really, really important to see what Jesus is saying here. First of all, the we Jesus refers to here are himself and John the Baptist. Himself and John the Baptist. Why himself and John the Baptist? Because he and John the Baptist, they were the only ones at this point, the only two people declaring the things of God to the people of God. So he says... We speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not, do not receive our testimony. But what we really need to hear are these words. We speak what we know and testify what we have seen. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that both he and John the Baptist, they are eyewitnesses of the things that they are declaring. You know, we read in John 1.32, and John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus had been a witness to the exact same event. He was the one that the Spirit came down upon and remained. To say the very least, it is a very serious thing to hear the testimony of an eyewitness to something and not believe the witness. I mean, just consider. Just consider this. This is hypothetical. Just consider, after baptizing Jesus and seeing the Spirit descend on him and remain, what if John would have thought, well, the Spirit has indeed come upon this man Jesus like a dove and remain, but surely he can't be the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. You know, if that had been John's attitude, the ministry of Jesus would have been stopped right then and there. And it would have ended because the voice of one crying in the wilderness would have been silent. Jesus and John the Baptist, they were truthful to their testimony. And Nicodemus needed to receive it for what it was. Then Jesus switches gears on Nicodemus. He had included John the Baptist in the we of verse 10, chastising Nicodemus for not receiving their testimony. His next statement doesn't include the plural we. Now Jesus speaks of the singular I and states, if I told you earthly things, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? There were going to be many more things that Jesus was going to be revealing to Nicodemus and the others heavenly things. If the listeners couldn't accept and believe the earthly things Jesus was talking about, you know, things that they should have all been familiar with, how were they going to believe the heavenly things Jesus was going to talk about? It was time for Nicodemus to do some serious, serious thinking and pondering regarding spiritual matters. That's what Jesus was saying to him. What Jesus has told Nicodemus, there, there are things and words for us to hear. For too long, those of us who belong to the church of Jesus Christ have spent years going to church 
and listening to messages prepared by pastors and teachers. But what has become of all those messages? Have the listeners to all these messages thought about them after they have left the church building? Have the listeners pondered them? Have we allowed the Holy Spirit to use the messages to do spiritual heart surgery in us? I fear the answer is no. I fear there is more interest in what we're going to do, to, what we're going to go out and have for dinner, okay, or lunch, or whatever we want to call it, or what we might need to pick up at the store, or a whole host of other things that could be on our minds. While we sit right here, this is tragic. One of our favorite songs here at Living Word Fellowship is Ancient Words. Its chorus is, ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. We really do need to let the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, change us. We can't, to go, we can't afford to go through the motions of faith. You see, the hour is very late. There's so much that's going to be coming our way as we move further and further and further into these end times. We really are going to need God's word engraved upon our hearts. We really do need to inwardly digest every word. We can't do anything less than this. This is what we've got to do. Amen.